So here we are in our second week of the season of Epiphany, which is a season of light and revelation, a season of searching, discovering, finding, knowing. And this morning, we have in our readings two stories about people who had their own epiphanies about who God is and who God was calling them to be. I'm not addressing the second lesson, which was a lot. If you have questions and want to talk about it, I am happy to do so afterwards, but I couldn't make a good fitting in for this. So, so back to our two sto- other stories. Neither of them, at first glance, seem to be particularly qualified to be called by God. And in each of these stories, someone else helps their epiphanies along by simply pointing to God. First, we have Samuel. Now, in the story, Samuel is about 12 years old. He was living at the temple, apprenticing Eli, the priest, having been given to the temple to be raised up um, there by his mother, Hannah. And we are told that this story occurs at a time when, quote, the word of the Lord was rare and visions were not widespread. This is a very polite reference to the fact that Eli's sons were corrupt. They were priests of the Lord, just like their father, but not because of any particular call, but rather because of their legacy of their father being a priest. Unlike their father, they were scoundrels, is what the scripture dubs them, but that too is a gentle word. They were, they were not good. <laughs> so one night, 12-year-old Samuel hears a voice calling him, and he reasonably assumes that it is Eli. So he goes up and goes to Eli and says, you called me, here I am. Only Eli hasn't called him and sends him back to bed. This happens twice more until all of a sudden Eli goes, oh, gosh, that's probably God speaking to you. Next time, don't come running in. Simply say, here I am. And listen, you know, listen to what God tells you to do. So this young boy in the middle of the night does just that. And it is not an easy conversation. We don't hear it in today's lesson. But basically, God tells him that he needs to go prophesy to Eli about the fall of his house, his reign as priest, because of the corruptions of his son. And Samuel goes on to do that. Eli actually takes it very well. And Samuel goes on to be known as one of the greatest prophets of God. But it all starts because Eli points him to the realization that God was speaking. Eli sets aside the desire for God to speak through him. He doesn't balk at the fact that God is now speaking to a young 12-year-old. He lets God be God and points Samuel to do the same. Then in our gospel lesson this morning, we have a brief story about Jesus calling some of his disciples. The story picks up just days after our gospel lesson from last week, Jesus' baptism. Jesus, still probably damp from his baptism in the River Jordan, has just called Andrew and Peter to be his disciples. And then, in the curious language of the Gospel of John, he decides to go to Galilee, where he finds Philip and tells him to follow him. And then Philip goes to his friend Nathanael and says, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, the one spoken about by the prophets, Jesus from Nazareth. Nathanael is not immediately enthusiastic, to say the least. In fact, he's suspicious, cynical, downright snarky, actually. You can imagine him spitting out the words, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth was considered as kind of backwater town um, with not a lot going for it. And this is where I find Philip to be a really good model. How easy it would have been for Philip to say, you know what, you're right, what was I thinking? 
Everyone knows that Nazareth is a backwards, inconsequential village. The people of Nazareth are uneducated, struggling to keep their heads above water. It's a depressing town. I'd be crazy to welcome someone like that into my life, much less drop anything to follow him. Thanks, Nathaniel, for setting me straight and reminding me that nothing good could come out of a dumpy place like Nazareth. Also, Philip could have simply changed the subject. But he doesn't do either of those things. He doesn't let Nathaniel's prejudice come in the way of what he knows in his heart to be true. He doesn't worry about seeming crazy and following this man Jesus. But he also doesn't argue with Nathaniel. He doesn't try to convince him that he's wrong. He doesn't try to reason with him. He simply refuses to answer the question and says instead, come and see. Simple, direct, and yet oh so courageous. Philip remains firm in his belief instead of caving to doubt. And Nathaniel, to his credit, does come and see. And I love that about Nathaniel, who we don't hear about again until a brief mention after Jesus' resurrection. But I like to think of Nathaniel as the original seeker, searcher, or doubter. He comes even before Thomas, even though there's a little bit of, uh, you know, some, some resonance there. Nathaniel goes and sees and allows himself to be transformed by the one who has seen him under a fig tree. The one who, in fact, has known him since before he was born. The same God who we hear about in today's psalm, who knits us together in our mother's womb, who knows and sees us. Nathaniel encounters God that day in a powerful call, and a call made possible in part because Philip said, come and see, and then lets God take it from there. Eli and Philip both use their knowledge, their relationship to God, to bring others into relationship with God. And they do so by simply pointing the way and then letting God be God. By letting God's path for the other person show itself. Eli sets aside his own desire for God to speak to him. Philip remains firm in his belief instead of caving to the snarky doubt of his friend and simply points to Jesus. This weekend, we remember and celebrate the great civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King. And in talking to some young people this week, I realized that many people forget that Dr. King was a pastor long before he led the marches in Birmingham and became a nationally known champion of civil rights. King believed deeply that it was God calling him and others to this work. And he didn't point to himself as an example for people to follow. He encouraged others to go and see Jesus and learn from the example of life that Jesus was pointing, that Jesus called people to follow. In fact, when the Reverend Dr. King developed his principles for the demonstrators of Birmingham to follow, the very first one was that they should meditate daily on the teachings and life of Jesus. So when King taught, sought to lead his revolution to transform a country, he pointed first to the gospel message. Another of his commandments was to walk and talk in the manner of love, for God is love. He also urged all people to pray daily and to seek to perform regular service for others and the world and to refrain from violence of fist, tongue, or heart. All grounded in God. Now, I always hesitate to tell stories of, you know, Eli, Samuel, because I feel like people are sitting there thinking, I'm not called in that way, I haven't had something dramatic, certainly not a lot like the Reverend Dr. King, and maybe not even like Nathaniel or Philip. And I know it can feel strange or undoable 
or uncomfortable to think about us individually pointing others to God or to Jesus or even perhaps to St. Thomas, despite your love of this place. But each of us has felt a call of God's, whether we recognize it or not, or we wouldn't be here this morning, whether we're seeking, searching, doubting. So hear the words of the psalmist this morning that say that God knows each of us intimately and know that we don't need to explain or argue or defend God or Jesus or the church, but simply say, here I am, come and see, and then let God be God and do as God will. In the name of the one who loves us and has given us life, amen.